the predatory tunicate. Uh, we had the high, the stocked hydrozoans. Uh, yeah, there's lots. Yeah. Giant Venus flytrap anemones. Yes, 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 yes. Right, oh. right. The, the giant stuff that nightmares are made of. Yeah. <laughs> All those squat lobsters. All the squat lobsters. Every single one. <laughs> and a few shipwrecks. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Actually, two of the things that I really enjoyed, and I hope to see the photos of, was when Jake was driving and saw that fossil whale fossil whale bone fossil and yeah. then also that really cute frog like fish yes the charnox that was yeah so and yeah, yeah that's great we saw another one when we were uh, sitting in for uh i think uh, when i was sitting in for hannah yesterday mm. during dinner so there was another uh, fossilized whale bone wow oh, yeah we've been so lucky to see so yeah. many of those also, the the uh, multiple-headed colophagus sponges. Mm, yeah. This means so much. Yeah. yeah. So a portion of the expedition was on the Battle of Midway shipwrecks, and we saw things there for the first time. We did a more complete examination of the USS Yorktown aircraft carrier and the Kaga Japanese aircraft carrier we did the first ever visual survey of the Akagi, the flagship aircraft carrier sunk during the Battle of Midway in 1942. Those are all also posted on the Nautilus Live yeah. website. There are yep. excerpts of that. So from the historical standpoint, some of that was, you know, very new discovery. Mm -hmm. And um, like never an before seen footage, right? Quite, a, quite yeah. an interesting few days. Yeah. And then we got on to the giant undersea Venus flytrap. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for sharing, everyone. I'm sure uh, those students appreciate that. And um, to answer a few more questions, how long can a Nautilus stay underwater? Um, we're not actually underwater on the Nautilus. Nautilus is the vessel, so the ship on the top, um, just, you know, bobbing with the waves. And we send a ROV, remotely operated vehicle, um, or actually two of them, down into the water and then they can explore. And most of our dives are about 24 hours, but they could stay down longer. It's just we also need to make sure we maintain them. Um, everyone gets some rest. Uh, we have enough sample space. So um, thanks for your questions and thanks so much for learning with us. Yeah, yeah, the ship can operate 24 hours. The ROV, the robots deep in the ocean can operate a long time. We stand watches, so we change watches every four hours. And we have three teams on board that take shifts in the control van. So this is the middle watch. We also call it the dead man's watch <laughs> from midnight to 4 a.m. And we also stand watch in the afternoon from noon to 4 p.m. And then, uh, you know, several hours from now, if you're watching, you'll see us do a, a watch change. And the right. next team will come in, but the ROVs will still be diving on the seamount, the Gambia Shoals, and currently we're at a depth approximately 2,160 meters. Did we do introductions? Nope. Not yet. Yeah. Whenever uh, we feel like we're in a good position, again, we don't want to make things difficult as we navigate and maneuver, so um, whatever's a good time. Go ahead, Mia. Oh. <laughs> Me? You, you got started it. I gotta start. I wanted to make sure you guys were ready. We're by cool. a giant rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you saw All right. Introduce I'll introduce myself. Hi, <laughs> I'm Mia. Um, I am serving as the navigator on this watch. When I'm not working as a navigator, I'm working as a seafloor mapper, collecting data. Uh, and I hope that I've inspired other people to look into geography and the discipline. And if you're into exploration, you know, where else can you create new maps uh, than the deep sea? So. Yeah, very cool. Every Everyone um, is always very inspired by your passion for learning. So <laughs> thanks for sharing. 
Um, and then whenever you want to pass it to... I'll pass it over to Dan if he's ready. I'm Dan. I'm sitting in the Hercules chair at the moment by a giant rock. <laughs> <laughs> Again? Another rock. This one has some stuff on it. So. A lot of stuff on it. Yeah, let's pause introductions and take a look at this rock. Yeah, it's a definitely a large polypogon sponge, lots of chrysogorgids, and uh, I'm not sure what this is. If we can have a quick zoom, that will be great. Sure. Thank you. It looks like a small bamboo coral whip as well. Go ahead, Jaina. That looks like a primnoid fan from a distance. Can be a bamboo coral fan as well because I can't make out the skeleton. Is that the full zoom? Uh, yeah, I would. I'm still trying to see. I'm not very sure because I, um, from the angle we have, we can't look. The skeleton is not that clear, so it can be a bamboo coral, can be a primnoid as well. Go in for a second for me. Do you have full wide? Full wide, yeah. You want to uh, hold position, please? So DSC and a full zoom, please. <laughs> yeah, I don't see the banding. Do you guys see the banding? I don't. So if we, so in that case, it would be a primnoid. Thank you so much for this view. Thanks a lot. Our pleasure. Okay, figure why thanks. It's interesting how the other side of the rock looks pretty bare. I mean, we've seen that a lot, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I guess maybe the way the current flows. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there a lot of current yeah. right now? Seems to be. Popular rock. There's a nice yeah. Waldaria sponge with bamboo corals. So uh, before I forget the big fish that we saw a little while ago, mm. so we think that it is in the family Cynaphobranchidae and 
probably a genus in Ephobranchus. Uh, that's what we think it is. In that case, that would be the first cutthroat eel that we have seen, at least during our watches. Oh. So that's interesting. Do you have any more information about that common name, cutthroat? It's like, I think it's one of the, considered to be one of the true eels, but now I don't know why it's called cutthroat. <laughs> Why do they get this I'm gangster like this. me? <laughs> I have no idea. So that was an eel, not a fish? Uh, well, yeah. like a type of fish? It is like a yeah, eel, yeah. Eel is type of fish, yeah. right? And for our other students asking, where is your next destination? Um, so. Uh, so you can see the different expeditions from this year and uh, previous years. Uh, so if you go to our page, nawslive.org, it shows the remaining expeditions, um, most of which I think will be in continuing in um, Hawaii and then also in Jarvis Island. So that's going to be the remainder of this season, but again, there'll be more exploration next year, uh, but it's focused on the Central Pacific again. Yeah, and this very beautiful fan that we're seeing to our left that would be a bamboo coral a kerato i see in the, in the i4 clade they may have been now uh designated into a new genus and a species but uh, i'll have to look up a couple of papers for that but it is what is from the i4 clade and we have a couple of chrysogorgias and what looks like an ophiroid probably on the small chrysogorgia there it's a fascinating symmetry with these bamboo corals. It looks like um, a taxonomy tree, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. For this mission, hmm. on this expedition, I'm not sure what our next destination is. I know we have several other seamounts right. to investigate. Yeah. Oftentimes we do the first dives on seamounts. They may have been mapped previously, but we're diving in areas that haven't been seen before. But I'm not sure which seamounts we're right, going to do next. Yeah. Zoom there. Yeah, if possible. Great. Yeah, we have the chief scientists on board for Ocean Exploration Trust, and we have science leads, Val Finlayson and, and Mike Brennan, but we're not going to wake them up right now to ask them which <laughs> email we're going to next. That looks like a bamboo coral fan. Yeah, thank you so much. Close enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Sorry. The view on the front porch, you can see it's kind Oh, of yeah. I, you know. Yeah, from the top. Thank you. There's a bunch of chrysogorgias, chrysogorgias, and I think I saw a mushroom coral at the, uh, under 
this. Yeah, we can see it right now as well. It's a really pretty view of Hercules as well. Yeah. I took a shot, Jane. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> oh, that! Are you looking at that tiny squishy thing? Yeah. Not gonna lie, Hans. I told Megan I'd help her edit those photos, and I did it like once, and I haven't done it since. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, Megan. Oh, that's yeah, a beautiful yeah. big anthomasis <laughs> that we have. We rarely see those big ones. They may be a completely different uh, species, but I've seen pictures of them, and maybe I've seen this big once or twice. I've there seen a couple of these. Yeah. I think it's well, there's a difference between the pseudo anthomasis yeah. and the anthomasis. So this is one of the one the of two. those two. <laughs> I forget which one has a stalk. Yeah, let me see if I yeah, can. Yeah, it is there in my notebook somewhere. It, but yeah. it's definitely Google doesn't know what that it, word is. Yeah, yeah, Google. Oh, I spelled it wrong. That's why. Uh, I had asked this Akwa, and she had explained to me. So it's in my notebook that which one of them has a stock. Probably the pseudo anthomastus has a stock and anthomastus doesn't. I will check. It might be the other way around. Other no. way around? I'm not sure. Let me look up Can the other be. ones. Wow. That is beautiful. Yeah. And it, it and you can see the size, like the one on the right is a Chrysogorgia and this is an Anthomastus. Both of them are Octocorals. They basically have the same anatomy in terms of the polyps. And you can see the stark difference in size of the polyps. So each one of those that are on the Anthomastus sticking out from the central is one of the small dots that we are seeing in the Chrysogorgia. Yeah, so I think this is the Anthomastus and the other one's called Pseudo-Anthomastus because Pseudo, yeah. it looks the uh, same but it doesn't have, have the, the long stalk. stalk. Okay. So I think Push it's it like, okay. right. yeah. I think that's why they named him that way. Yeah, I know the pseudoanthomasis genus was Good described point. later. And you can compare the polyps yeah, side small. by side, the size behind the Voltaria sponge, the dead Voltaria sponge. It's minuscule in comparison to each polyp, each uh, each polyp of this uh, anthomastus. It's actually very helpful because I've heard you talking about these things the whole time, but seeing seeing the yeah, yeah. and there's a little squat lobster. There's for a you. little squat Hello. lobster, yeah. And the typical like each polyp has eight tentacles. The tentacles are those arms extending out from uh, the polyps. So I'll circle. So each one of them is a polyp, and then each one of those these branches is a tentacle. And from each one of those tentacles, you have these uh, extensions coming out. Those are called the pinules. So these are only found in the octocoral. So that is how we identify that whether it's an octocoral or a hexacoral. Hexacoral won't have those pinules. That That's is beautiful. really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, and do all octocorals have pinules? Yes. Okay. That is a synapomorphy for the octocoral. So synapomorphy in evolution means a character which is a defining character for that group. So it will be present in all members unless it's lost in somebody. Sometimes it's lost in a few, but uh, it is only present in that group and not in any other group of organism. What did you call it again? Synapomorphy. Synapomorphy. Yes. It's like there's an eel-like fish in, yeah. this, in the background of the still camera. In the background of the still camera. That's Passed beautiful. Passed out of view. Thank you so much. Okay, I can go away and thanks. So pretty. Mm -hmm. 
another giant sponge. Yeah. I was looking at that on the Herc view. Yeah. And also the tail of a fish. Is that an elephant ear? Yeah, yes, it is. I think the fish in the background would be a halo sorry, yeah, given the know. shape. It's just above there. Wow, well, the texture is so cool. Yes, you're right. If it has a pronounced stalk, it's an anthomastus. If it does not, when not pronounced, it is generally a pseudoanthomastus. That was her word. Yeah. Yeah. We have collected these. They're mostly the same ones. That's great. And this was the one with those um, spicules that almost look like threads connecting yeah. it, right? That's yeah. pretty cool. For those watching, those two green laser dots are 10 centimeters or about four inches apart. So if you estimate maybe 10 of those across this elephant ear sponge, you're looking at something between three and four feet wide. Yeah, wow. that is massive. Um, and Hans brought up we got so distracted with that amazing rock with all the life on it that yeah, we, we totally stopped, forgot yeah. <laughs> introduction. So, um, Jake, would you like to continue? Yeah, for sure. Um, hello, Kako. My name is Jacob, and I'm the ROV engineering intern, and I'm sitting in the Atlanta chair. Stoked to be here. Aloha, my name is Jaina. I am the video engineering intern and I'm from Hilo Hawaii. Thanks, Jaina. And we'll bring it back to Elsie. Thanks, Kara. And good morning, good evening, everyone, and Ali. My name is Elsie and I'm a, a supporting scientist Did here on the question? Nautilus. And while I'm not on the Nautilus, I'm a researcher at the Palau International Coral Reef Center. And happy to be here. Awesome. Uh, we'll take a break for another wonderful Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is, okay, this again looks like a bamboo coral fan. But I can't make out if it's nodal or internodal. I think nodal. Uh, we have a little more Zoom if you want. Yeah, that would be great. Sure, go ahead. Where are they? Yeah, sometimes it's difficult to... Yeah, that's full. Oh, okay, that's fine. I think oh, it's yeah. nodal. It's nodal because yeah, here right I there. see it's coming out of the node. Okay, yeah, closer thank if you. you want. Are you happy with that? Are yeah. Okay, is there... I mean, yeah, I think this is fine. This is fine. Thank okay. you. Okay, go ahead. 
Are there normally no nodes on the base like we saw, or is it just we couldn't see the node um, at the base? Yeah, it depends on, on the kind of bamboo coral. Sometimes if they have a longer basal stalk, then you get the nodes because there's a distance. Sometimes like for these kinds of fans where they're branching very close to the base, I have noticed that you can't see the node very often. It depends, I think. All right, and I'll go ahead and continue our introductions. Um, I'm Kara. I'm working as the science communication fellow for this uh, watch. Uh, when I'm not here, I am based in Guam. I work as the seagrass and mangrove conservation coordinator for the Guam Core Reef Initiative. And I'll pass that on to Hans. Hello, thanks for tuning in. I'm Hans van Tilburg. Hello, Netherlands. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the watch lead chair. I am a maritime archaeologist and historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And happy to be looking at these amazing sites within this monument, Papahanao Makuakea. It's a very special place. Upashana. Thank you. Uh, I'm Upashana Ganguly. Uh, I am a biologist in this uh, in this team, and uh, I study the evolution of deep sea corals at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. I'm a PhD candidate there, and uh, yeah, Taylor. -Ann. Hi everyone. I am Taylor Ann. I am the science manager and data logger on this watch. I'm uh, logging all observations of what we're seeing. Um, including geology and biology, and as well as some of the, the current uh, that we're feeling here. Um, not sure, so much as we were earlier, I don't think, but um, yeah, when I'm not on the Nautilus, I work at UCLA as a research assistant and a project manager, um, and I'm also a master's student trying to finish my thesis at Cal State Northridge. Oh, five plus. Thanks, everyone, and so impressed. So impressed Morning. how you manage all those different things, Taylor Ann. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not easy, <laughs> but this is the best, the highlight for sure. <laughs> Coming out here is um, like a reset button for, I love it, yeah. Oh, five. 20 meters. 20, 20 meters. And we actually had a question asking about how do we remember um, all these terms like synapomorphy, <laughs> which is a pretty unique term. Um, so the question was asking, are there particularly goofy study phrases that you made up and still remember to this day? She's just an uh. angry coral woman. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I guess, uh, yeah, I definitely sometimes have used weird words to remember certain things. I've done that a lot, especially, like, not so much with what I do now, but earlier if it were subjects and topics that I wouldn't be so interested in, I would sometimes do that as a trick. But with these terms, what happens is that uh, as you work on a topic, you understand why something is called that, you break them down. So synapomorphy is quite easy to remember if you break down the word. So, um, so apomorphy is uh, so synapo like if you look at the root words. So it's uh, it's it you get used to it. It's not that you sit down and memorize. And I'm very bad. Like I cannot memorize and study that. I can never do that. I need to find patterns. I need to find. Uh, reasons behind logic and logical structure so that helps and when you use them it's not that the on the first day i started remembering these words i understood okay these mean these things so there's a word term for it and okay that's the root word it should be something around it and then you go back and you keep using them that after a while it becomes uh, you remember them and then there are lots of terms that i don't remember and i have to look up and we do look up we are not supposed to remember everything 
and yeah. as long as we understand the concept of what is happening why is it called so that is what matters and then you can always go back and look them up and it's just practice that is it yeah and um definitely uh we just posted on our instagram about um Bersinjits and how yeah. <laughs> Upashana used to um, think Bazinga in her mind. So, um, all sorts of like mnemonic devices can help people, right? Yeah. Um, I know personally, um, I've had songs that have helped me remember stuff. So, um, our eighth grade teacher made us sing the quadratic equation to Pop Goes the Weasel. Oh. And I still remember it to this day. Oh, that's like, great. <laughs> like, it's pretty amazing. Like, x equals negative b plus or minus <laughs> the square root b square minus 4ac <laughs> all over 2a. That's <laughs> so much <laughs> fun. <laughs> and then for biochemistry, we had to remember that, like, the, all the chemicals involved in glycolysis. And for that one, um, there was a medical student that made a video um, that was like a rap about glycolysis to Macklemore's thrift shop. Um, so I was sitting in like our test hall. It's like a very serious atmosphere with a lot of pre-med students. And I was just there like basically rapping thrift shop except <laughs> with like chemical components to myself. Like glucose to the glucose with the number six phosphate, PGI to the fructose six phosphate, ADP, ATP, one six fructose phosphate. <laughs> so it was pretty, <laughs> those were pretty helpful. <laughs> yeah, it helps. I've done a lot of those things with history. I love that. <laughs> oh, wow. Is this like a different type of iridogorgia? Yeah. I mean, or it is an iridogorgia, definitely. It just looks very or less um, yeah. fireworky. Like yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Still my favorite, though. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we have the Purogorgia at the base as well, and a Chrysogorgia there. Well, and also there are some excellent guides online, like yeah, the, the NOAA guide for absolutely. deep ocean corals. And, you know, if you right. see in one of the camera views what it looks like inside the van, you'll notice yeah. screens in front of the science party in the back row yeah. and so we yeah. use guides yeah constantly we're all, exactly online to look things up we are always referencing other material we are uh, exchanging conversations with other people who are experts in these group it's not that we remember some everything oh yeah and so then the science party is sure that's right, exactly is so a constant, they're very helpful uh, source of information they're watching along with everyone else or people in the lounge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lounge, the lounge. people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those would be the watch parties, uh, watch teams off duty. And some are not asleep. They might be in the lounge and there are monitors there where they can also watch the dive that's going on up here. Yeah. And we can yeah. bother them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Always great to get some rock advice yes. from the lounge. Yes. I think that's probably a nanoliprimnoid. And it helps, right? Okay, you see something like, yeah, I've seen it. I know where to look. I think practice just makes us un remember where to look and find the information. That is then. At least that's how, how I do it because I think this would be another colophagus sponge. Definitely a rosellid. And a very tall rosellid. So I learned something very interesting today about sponges. So we have been seeing not so much on this, okay, as we see. We can see a dead sponge stock on the uh, bottom, right? So the question, I think somebody asked that, uh, which is a genuine question, that why do we see the stalks? We never see the dead heads of the stalked sponges, right? Yeah. So what I learned from Chris Kelly is that, uh, the stalks are apparently made up of spicules, like singular spicules continuing, yeah. continuing the entire length. So it's not like the body of the sponge where it is made up of numerous small spicules. So those are long threads of silicious spicules. Oh, that's a beautiful bamboo coral. 
That is beautiful. It's one, two, three. It's great. Find someone that looks at you like Upashana looks like <laughs> looks at a bamboo coral. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw that in the background and I knew you were going to call it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you can prominently see the uh, alternating patterns at the base of this one. Which tells you that oh, it is a bamboo coral. Is that a tiny cup coral? and? Oh, something squishy yeah. down there too. Yeah, this, the, there are definitely a couple of cup corals and the squishy one looks like a sea cucumber. Yeah. So you were talking about the dead sponges? Yeah, it's the dead sponges. Yeah. And we got distracted by the bamboo coral. Yeah. So these are these are not the stalked sponges. So they are made of smaller spicules. Spicules are like uh, three pointed needles made up of silica, which are which form the structural part of the glass sponges. So these are made of the smaller spicules. But when we have the stalked ones, so the stalk is made up of those sil silica fibers, which are very long. So like a bunch of very long uh, silica fibers fro form the uh, base, the stalk. Whereas the heads are made up of smaller spicules. Now when, so what happens is that the the head when, when a sponge dies, because of the difference in weight, because for these vast like sponges the weight is more equally distributed so those top part of the sponges they topple over and because they have the smaller spicules they disintegrate faster and dissolve faster whereas those very long silica threads of the bases they remain intact and that's why we so see those fallen down stalks but never really the heads yeah. that was very interesting and i think spicules are so interesting too because they come in like different shapes different shapes yeah There's mono axon which basically looks like a basic shard triaxons mm -hmm. right. with like multiple points or yeah. three points tetra axon then there's ones that kind of uh. look like anchors mm -hmm. as well so um, we used to do a lab with students where they would actually dissolve a sponge yeah, and then look we at did those spicules. Well. It was yeah. so wonderful to look under the microscope. Yeah, these little tiny shapes. Yeah. So cool. I Geometric. think the basal one was uh three-dimensional and then they modified so there's something like that I think the basal spicules yeah, evolutionary yeah. were I like don't three, remember there's something we didn't get that far <laughs> <laughs> the sp sponge spicule study push in there a bit for us hold that for a sec thanks zoom in a little bit more. Uh, can we get a little bit more zoom on this? Yeah, let me uh, put a toe out here. Okay, thank you. A good DSC though. There was. Oh, yes. Yes. I got it. Let's turn and sit on that rock right there. Try that again. I love those soft uh, cherry blossom looking. Yeah, the Chrysogorgias, right? Chrysogorgias, yeah. I think 
the word chryso is yellow pigment, right? Golden pigment. Hence, they're also called the cold mm, coral. Come down the back, please. Pulling me into it. Oh, it's so down like I gotta come around the other side there. It's Atlantis trying to pull me into it. Roger. Uh, you can come back up. But Sorry. Thanks, Kara. And now a pop goes the weasel stuck in my head. <laughs> Is it the weasel version or the quadratic equation version? <laughs> the original version. <laughs> Are you the kind of person that gets songs like popping in your head a lot of the times? Yes, like the, I think they're called earworms. Oh, right, that's the term for it. Yeah. What's your common earworm? Uh, I don't necessarily have one, and I don't want to think of any right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting stuck. But for me, it's like the worst of songs that I don't even like. I they know. get stuck in my really? head. Yeah. I mean, I don't want Pop Goes the Weasel stuck in my head. That's. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it's like mm -hmm. the Star Spangled Banner for some reason, <laughs> like pops into my head sometimes. So random. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I'll just be at home like singing that to myself sometimes. <laughs> I like that. Randomly just stand up, face the back. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that very vulnerable moment. And then around holiday time, it's like all the Christmas yeah, music. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're all like playing everywhere also, right? So mm -hmm. that makes sense. Okay, wait, I have to know. Is anyone on this watch a Christmas person? Like Christmas music? Like you like to listen to it before Thanksgiving? Are you anti or pro? Because most people are usually extreme on either <laughs> side. I'm 100% pro Christmas Oh my god, Mia, music. you're my person. Before yeah. Thanksgiving <laughs> or after Seven Thanksgiving? Nine. Uh, you know, whenever I... <laughs> All when the time? Right now. Right now? <laughs> Not really. It's too hot. <laughs> After July. <laughs> After July? <laughs> oh my god. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a uh, Paragorgia? I'm confused. I'm still trying to teach myself how to differentiate between the two, and sometimes I'm getting confused. Uh, the branching and the polyps. Yeah, yeah. yeah so basically, Both hemichorallium are. or corallium sh must sh will have two polyps coming out. This is a paragorgia. This is a paragorgia. So like on the end of the branch? Yeah. So it will be, if it's multiple, like even from one point, like here where it's not like here we can see like three or four coming out from one point right polyps so if that is the case then apparently it is supposed to be a paragorgia if it is a hemichorallium or corallium it's supposed to be just two polyps 
No, I'm not very sure about this difference. Okay. I want to confirm it by my uh, advisor or Asako or Tina, but this is one of the traits apparently of differentiating the two. Thank you so much, because these two can look very similar. Okay, you can go in. And I always forget which is the flexible one. It's paragoid, yeah. because it's okay. called, remember, bubblegum coral. Yes, yeah. Oh, also like chewy like bubble gum. Yeah, so I don't know if that's how they got the name, but <laughs> that's how I remember. <laughs> so Hemichorallium actually is not a bubble gum. No, no. So they're in the same family. Paragordia previously was in a different family, Paragordiaidae, but now everything is in the family Coralliaidae. Okay. So Corallium are the precious corals, right, which are harvested also. The red corals for jewelry and oh everything. Oh yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I've, I've heard yeah. of them. Yeah. So those are brittle. They, they are not bubble gummy. Because they are used in jewelry. Yes. So there's red corals, blue corals, black corals that yeah. I know that they use for jewelry. Yeah. yeah, black corals also used for jewelry, you're right. Uh, we had a very interesting question from a viewer asking, are there any sponges, corals, or other plant life, um, I assume in the deep sea, that have been found that have applications in medicine? Do you know anything about particular natural products that have been discovered from yeah. the deep sea? Yes. So there, I think I can't tell you the names of those biochemical compounds because uh, I don't I'm not good at remembering those names, and I've never really tried, but I know there are several biochemical compounds, especially in, with medicinal purposes, that have been derived from uh, several of the deep sea uh, corals. Uh, I know the group Acanthogorgia, they, they have some biochemical compounds that have been utilized. Uh, I think some flexorids as well, several several uh for sponges i'm not sure but definitely the siliceous spicules and the siliceous fibers that we see in the sponges have been a major uh, part of influencing uh i forget the term the very uh, the high tension sil uh what fibers are those called the what's used for internet and in for which one for internet and everything, those fibers which I used, they were first. Oh, like fiber optic? Fiber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fiber optics and the concept was, I think, first. Uh, one of the concepts that influenced the development of fiber optics was sponge spicules and their strength. Wow, really? The strength of those long fibers. That's amazing. Yeah, there are some sponges like that are commonly called yeah. fiber optic sponges. Yeah. Wow. Especially like the hyalonema, like these, mm -hmm. the same family. Where you see those, they have those extensions at the base which attach the uh, big elephant ear sponge, the polyopogon to the base. So there's another in the same family, the hyalonema, uh -huh. in which these uh, fibers are very prominent. So those specifically. Wow. And I know in the past, I don't know if it was 2020 or 2021, but OET, um, I remember they had, I wasn't on it, but they had a cruise dedicated to um, exploring um, organisms, looking at organisms for biomedical yeah. purposes. And so it's definitely something that is done. Um, Quite and so, yeah, you could probably yeah. look that up on the Nautilus website. And no, I don't, no, sorry, I don't have any helpful information yeah. other like the no, name no, or anything no, of the expedition, but I, I know think. it was an expedition in yeah. the past. That's awesome. There's lots, yeah. there's lots. Yeah, and um, just doing a quick search of deep sea natural products. So that's often a term mm -hmm. uh, people use if they're talking about like useful chemicals uh, de found from nature. Uh, this particular view, um, and I'll, 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 I can come back to it after the sponge if we want. Oh no, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's another one of those uh, polyopogon sponges, and I think this one clearly tells us why it is called the elephant's ear sponge. Yeah. yeah that <laughs> so was a, maybe about a meter high. Yeah. Too. Wow. And has that shape, has that curvature, the convex and the concave. 
uh, part and we have that one which is the Ferredi sponge in the uh, Aspidoscopula genus but it's unfortunately dead but they're beautiful looking sponges. Earlier we saw a trumpet sponge. Uh, I think we used to call like it was dead, but I've seen them on previous dives and we called them like a Cheeto something sponge. <laughs> okay. But I cannot find the scientific name or um, yeah, pictures of it. And I'm like over here trying to find it and I still can't and I don't oh. want to write down Cheeto sponge. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an image of it? Uh, yeah, let me try to look it up again yeah. in my old still caps. If we could grow Cheetos to this size, <laughs> that, would, that would be quite an accomplishment. And if we could grow Cheetos, that itself will be a big world hunger. I forgot that's your favorite snack. <laughs> I love Cheetos. Everyone on board loves Cheetos. The Cheetos go so fast. And the, the salted chips ones, the blue packets. I think mm. I've never had, got a chance to taste any one of them. Oh. That's another bamboo coral at the back and in the front also, and some chrysogorgias. A bamboo web and a beautiful elephant ear sponge again. So, I, yeah, you were no, you talking about the natural it. products. Oh, no worries. Um, yeah, just wanted to share this uh, review covering 2009 to 2013, and they found. Um, they were reviewing a bunch of chemicals I guess people have isolated from um, cnidarians. So like anemones, corals, uh, jellyfish and relatives, echinoderms, so sea stars, sea urchins, sea... Um. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. That's Ooh, speaking of sea stars. Yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful. I think this will last it. Is. I love when things have that pop of color. Yeah. yeah. And this one's so, like, symmetrical. Like something you'd put at the top of a Christmas tree, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think you should have a sea star themed Christmas tree. <laughs> Come back down a couple meters for me. Coming back down a couple meters. I do have a star, so I can just maybe add a couple extra appendages. <laughs> just a family. Nobody knows probably. And maybe they know now. And there's some, I think there's um, parasitic things on it, like we uh, saw earlier. Oh, yeah, the um, animal. Yeah. Polychaetes, I polychaetes, think. They were. Polychaetes, yeah, the green polychaetes. I think it's trying to get to that Chrysogorgia. Slowly. How many arms does it have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't know if you got the DSC, it's going to disappear under there. Oh, that's a beautiful view on the yeah. DSC. See? Yeah, it's gradually moving towards the Chrysogorgia. You can see wow. that. The texture is so interesting, too. Mm -hmm. We're witnessing an attack. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it also has a bunch of polychaetes on it. Pushing a bit there. One, two, three, four at least of those polychaetes. So would it be parasitic if it's a polychaete? I think those yes. are, okay. yeah. I think the poly these polychaetes are probably parasitic. Did you move south the last time? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, it's a beautiful like sea star. It's a beautiful sea star. Why did we change our uh, bearing? I thought we were doing uh, two something. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. I just heard the 20 meters. Uh, no, I think I'd want to uh, go back. 
to the where I want to go. See the red lines there? I want to hit those. Yeah. Okay, go away. Good. Yes, thank you. It would be impressive if um, that sea star was really able to eat that Chrysogorgia because it looks so fragile. That sea star was so big. Yeah. I feel like it would just topple over. <laughs> but maybe, it, maybe its maybe two feet would hold yeah. on. Yeah. It's like one arm at a time. It's yeah. not going to go over it completely. Yeah. Gradually. It's it's smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I would have gone for the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I would have jumped onto it. Um, it's really like the green ones. And sorry, I'll just quickly finish this na yeah, uh, natural yeah. products uh, review. So um, basically, they study a bunch of different marine organisms, mollusks, sponges, echinoderms, and they uh, reviewed it and found that about 75% of the compounds had some sort of bioactivity, meaning they um, probably in tests with like cells or other, not humans, but simpler things. Uh, they found cytotoxicity, Bring so it's toxic to right towards human cancer cells. Mm -hmm. um, and another one also, um, there's a lot of deep sea bacteria as well. Plain so like match her exciting, please. They found that chemicals from these bacteria could um, also have uh, anti-cancer properties or anti-diabetic. Um, affect cholesterol levels, so there's definitely a lot of um, studies about yeah. chemicals from bacteria and other organisms in the deep sea. But I think it just takes a really long time to develop these also, to test them fully, um, and make sure they not only work in the way that they, we believe they work, but they don't cause harm to people too, if we were ever to use them as medicine. Yeah. Uh, come left oh, just a thing. little bit on your heading. 210, maybe. 210. The lounge chair up. <laughs> a foot rest. Well, that's right. It looks like Pretty that. big chair. Interesting. Interesting shape. There's like two chairs facing each other. I was thinking one half of a mini ramp. I will definitely ask the geologists about this when they wake up. Yeah, I wonder what this is. If it's, my guess is a pillow, but a it looks very square. Uncomfortable pillow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you step 20, uh, 210, please? And by pillow, we mean pillow lava, right? Yes. You? Yes. Talking to you, 20, 210. And look at that on the underside. Yeah. We have a bunch of Chrysogorgias, one a beautiful primnoid, some Down sponges. Five. Down five. Down five, there's a huge polypo gone in the background. It's beautiful. Top five. All right. This would be a great photogrammetry rock. Oh, yeah. It's amazing how just one side of it has so many corals, but not the others.
Right. From this view, it kind of looks like an old desktop computer. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely right. Or a very uncomfortable chair. <laughs> Is that a sea cucumber the on top? Uh, sitting right there. I, I think so. It looks like a clear synalactic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. There's a clear synalactic. There's an anthomasis and a small hemicorallium paragordia. Coralliate recruit. Now it's easier because they're in the same family. So we can get a, we can just call them the family when we are not sure. It looks like a dead base of a coral overgrown by hydroids. Roger. Right. Come up a little now. Roger. Call me at five. You can uh, chase me around here too if you want. Roger. Uh, we had another coral question asking, do coral polyps retract completely to eat after they catch something out of the water column? Or is seeing the, uh, their attraction unrelated to feeding and for other reasons? Yes, that's a good question. So, okay. Yes and no. I think everything for me comes with yes and no. There are certain groups in which the polyps can completely retract. There are other groups where it's contractile. So for the con so at the base of the polyps they have they can have a structure I think which is called the calyx. So some some polyps can completely retract into that region or some can contract. That is they become smaller but they're still visible from the outside. Uh, so it depends on the group and there are other corals where they don't do either. They just you know kind of close all the tentacles and become smaller. Now the response is can be feeding, they can be uh, as a defense mechanism which is more obvious when they are afraid of something, for example light, uh, like mechanical touch, like when we are moving very close to the uh, coral colonies or they have like smaller organisms and predators coming by, they'll contract or retract and close up depending on the group of coral that we're talking about. Thanks for that. Yeah. So we are seeing two different bamboo coral fans. One more yellowish, one more pinkish. I think the pink one is probably an echnomyces or a carrot. I have to check. I really like these giant polyopagons. Yeah. It's like a polyopagon garden. <laughs> Here and there, but there are many of them. There are many of them. Very large. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, I think so. Just one Cheeto that size, you know, could feed a family for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> I think before that, we first have to make sure that Cheetos can grow on a tree or anything, <laughs> and then think about how large. Well, one can dream. One can dream. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, well, there, never mind, never mind. Go cycle the autofocus on uh, Atalanta camera. It's going wonky there. Sorry, we're 
trying to hit this feature in the sonar. Also a pretty good return. How's that purple right there? It's very striking. Yeah. Yeah, so that Atalanta focus is because somebody had autofocus on up here. Um, doesn't usually work well just because it keeps on fine. What, what's that? Um, Whoever was here last put autofocus on Atalanta, and right. that usually just doesn't work well because the focus is constantly trying to find it. Right. So turn that off. It should be yeah, better. Sometimes they autofocus at watch change, so. That's kind of my. I've done that more than once. And yes. Did you find it? What is it? I think I've seen that. I've seen like in the... Wait. Wait. So we'll find it. I've seen like hundreds of these, but I cannot remember its name other than the Cheeto Sponge. And it doesn't help that our Twitter page only shows the nickname. Cheeto also. Sponge. Or our X page. Right. I think it's the urated or the ferried. I didn't see it in the guide, but maybe I just need to look in another guide. No. I know that the urated page is not really updated. There's a lot of urated sponges, um, which are not here in the... doesn't help the internet is also slow um, we had a question also about whether um, the sponges we've been seeing, like how long would it take those sponges to grow? Do we have any idea of that? They're very old. Uh, I am not that well versed on the age of sponges, but I can tell you that some of those very tall ones, I would believe can be hundreds of years old, at least. I mean, it would be in that uh, range, in that scale, sorry. Okay, Mia, looks like we can go south this time. Okay. Sonar targets to the south. So 20 at 180? 20 at 180, yes, please. Bridge now. Can we please step 20 at 180 southerly? Thank you.
I, and that's a nice anemone, and we have lots of chrysogorgias and uh, um, small coralliid. Down five for me. Hit the rocks are too low. Yep. <laughs> Tries to pull me in when I'm yeah. facing you like this. Alright, don't fight. Alright, okay. You can uh, look to your right a little bit too. Roger. Taylor Rand, how long has it been since we've had a rock sample? I think it wasn't too long ago, but this is an interesting area, and we're at a, a kind of a break in the slope, getting near waypoint seven. Let me check that for you. Um, it was our last okay, sample was a rock. Um, they did not know which white point it was by. Um, Mia, could you check which sample number 98 where that was? Sure, give me a second. Thanks. Up oh, five. It was uh, almost right on uh, waypoint six, and we're very close to waypoint seven. So let me measure here. Should we wait a bit and collect one and we point seven or do we want to collect here? So Yeah, this seems like it could be um different. A good yeah, like a good spot. Um the it doesn't matter if we do it here or at waypoint seven. Um, it starts to get steeper and higher, though, um, and that. I know that was something that Val wasn't as interested in in collecting okay. when we get too high. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, at waypoint seven, that should be a good. Yeah, if we can find a, a nice angular, you know, uh, grapefruit-sized, you know, angular rock near where we're seeing these these large formations that are, you know, fracturing in this kind of you know 90-degree pattern, uh, that might be of interest. To Val. And the one thing I was just going to ask, yeah. so I know that the front bio box is full. Right. And we can't slurp. Our right. I mean, I know Taylor Ann has the list, so. Yeah, we have room still okay. in the starboard boxes. We have three. Okay. And um, if we need to, we can also, like, put a coral on top of a rock. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's the sponge. You found it. What is it called? Doesn't say. Another one that doesn't say. Hexactinellid. Hexact. Okay. Roger, but it wasn't in the guide, right? Yeah. Uh, no, it's not okay. in the guide. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But something. But you wanted a uh, 210? 220? Yeah, back to where the sonar targets are. I've seen this so I'll many times. And I have Roger. annotated Close it for the yeah. Okeanos as well because there was somebody Ish. in this vase, the trumpet class part. Come right up for me and make sure I just didn't tie a knot in the tether. I should have gone the other way there. Didn't look like you did. Yeah, she mentioned to me, you know, the slope breaks are good places where we see things that might be of interest. And this is one of them, and it's got those large formations. And yeah, I think we this have, would we be have room. an ideal spot to for a collection then. I think you're good. And I'm so caught up on that sponge because I don't think we've seen that at all. And it was not living, so it's interesting. Yeah. I've seen this a lot of times. I just haven't uh, seen it on this expedition, I No, mean. not Sorry. this expedition, yeah. but like in the others. 
I wish I could. Uh, Even this right one. No, Hexactinellida species. Okay. This Maybe is Hexactinellida. I'm going to come back under you for. Roger. What is this one? I think we're okay in this yeah. breeze, but I think we're good too. Hard to see. Hmm, with the class. NOAA OER 2016, deep water wonders of lake. Is this the spot? I don't know. You tell me. Yeah. Same. Happy? Uh, let's see. We want a nice angular wedge-shaped one. That might be a little small. Uh, this might be wedge-shaped. They look fairly loose. I don't know until we poke one. Uh, that one's got, but this one's got potential. I just want to make Val happy. That okay, one's got some potential. Okay, take Can we get the bubble cam? Porch what? cam? It's on the Is it? manipulator. Oh. I'll turn on the light. Uh, light's on. It's just being wonky. Sorry, I can uh, show you the whole minute with the, uh, let me rack back here, you know, have more of a view. Yeah. This one, yeah? Well, let's I'm try not sure which that. One is not oh. that one, it's welded. <laughs> that one's welded. welded. <laughs> Sorry, uh, stand by. Pick them up, pick them up, up a bit. Sorry. That one didn't move. Yeah, well, I'm <coughs> you, um. Is that a separate one? Push the sub off there. Yeah. So if you see the camera move, that's you. I try this one next to him. Right there? Right behind the arm, right there. Right behind it? Right there. Cir that one? Circling one's up there oh, for you. Oh, right there. Got you. Let's see if that's wedge-shaped or angular. Nope. Nope. Loaded. Solid. What about uh, one this? One right to the right moved. This one, that one moved? Yeah, I believe so. That was the first one, right? That I hit. Yeah, but you poked okay. straight down and oh. lifted the vehicle yeah. up. That moved. It's loose. All right. Gentle poke. It's, it's just like shopping for someone, trying to buy the right gift. We'll have to give it a spin and take a look. You uh, zoom in for the victory roll? <laughs> Good, thanks. Ooh. It's not rounded. That was a really good pickup, Jacob. Thank you. Yeah, I like that side of it, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like this. I think that's a good one. I think so, too. You're good to wipe. Yeah, you can go in. I'm going to put this back on the uh, azimuth there for you. And I got the sample also. Oh. oh, 
Oh, and I gotta change the camera too. Oh, sorry. And um, we have starboard box E. Oh, am I hitting something? Open. Yeah, you are. You're gonna yeah. pick up a little more on the hill there. There's a rock right there. Oh. Am I hitting that? <laughs> Here, let me come up a bit for you. Did you say E as an elephant? Yes. Sorry, I just didn't think they were listening yet. Um, yeah, E as an elephant, C, or D as in dog. Roger. Okay, it should be clear now. The depth is two, one, two, three. Sorry, box, sorry, box. Oh, oh, oh. So, uh, E is open? Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, go for E. It's going for E. See your um, in that camera, your pitch is all the way. Yeah. So it's at a hard stop. So you now have a six function manipulator. There we go. I bring the yaw to the right a little bit. The yaw to the right. Wrist right. Yeah. Wrist to yaw as they go on. Pitch up just a little. Wrist pitch up. There you go. There we I go. got you there. That should be bombs away there. Nice. Nope, nope. Wrist pitch up. This one, Jacob. This guy here. Uh, bombs away. Nice. Nice, Jake. That was sample number 099. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, great job, Jake. I hold what you got there. I'll put, oh, you're fine. Yeah. You got that elbow way up in the air now. Yeah. Slow, slow movements, man. Slow, slow, slow. Um, bring the shoulder down. You're up like this. Yeah. So you need to bring that guy down. Easy, oh, easy, oh, oh, easy. Oh, I thought I halted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We call that freeze fail. Freeze fail. Yeah, let me come up a bit more. Uh, swing back around to your left now so you can see it in the big camera. Swing left a little more, you'll be able to see it in the main camera. Now you can see what you got to do. That's good on the swing left. Yeah, no more swing left.
Just remove something from a very special area. Mahalo. Yeah, thank you for that reminder, Hans. So when we collect these samples, these rocks, or whether they're biology or geology, all of them are sacred and very, very rare um, collections that we're making. Um, and I know that the rocks are not just representative, but are in fact the ancestors or the kapuna of the native Hawaiian peoples. Um, and Jaina or Jake, if you want to elaborate on that, feel free to. I just wanted to um, make sure that we honor that uh, with you know, every collection if we can, um, just to make sure that we're being mindful of, of what we're taking. You get a shit on the head, exactly. Ew. Yeah, thanks for that, Taylor Ann. Um, yeah, as you said, we're in indigenous land right now, in Papa no Moku Okea, so with every sample collection, whether that be biology or geology. Um, it's important to recognize that we are an indigenous land, and this is the land um, where in Papua Nau Moku Okea, the ancestral land for the native Hawaiians, and we believe this is our ancestral land and also where our deities live. Um, and so, yeah, everything right. from biology to just the rocks, um, we believe they have spirits, and so we're taking something from its home personal, um, from its home permanently, and we would just like uh, to thank that rock we just collected, and just be grateful and respectful for the area we're in and for what we're collecting. Hey -ho. So thank you. Yeah, nicely said. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jaina. Sorry, go ahead. Did you? Okay. Okay, you can come up now. I'm going to come right under you. Roger. Up five. Come right up, mate. Come right up. Something. I think I would turn that way. Uh, I'm gonna put your nose into the current when you turn, so the tether goes the other way. Okay. Uh, does it probably doesn't matter here. That's good. Come around there, see what happens. Okay. Uh, when you have a 50/50 choice, you. It's uh, turn your nose into the current so the tether blows out behind yeah. you. Which it is, yeah? Yeah, I think so. All right. Another giant paleopogon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. I like them. Yeah. And with some Coralliad recruits and some Chrysogorgias. So all these things are pretty specialized to the deep ocean environment, is that correct? There aren't, you know, similar species. The shallow water species are, are quite different. 
And there might be only a couple things like like the tenophores or or jellies that might be able to live in both environments or, or are they all, are they all only in one environment or the other no, come down in terms of depth? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a very yeah. interesting question and as come usual down, uh, my answer would be yes and no. <laughs> so, uh, at least for the octocorals, I can say more specifically that even within the same family or the same, uh, yeah, the super families, uh, we have certain coral genera that are specific to the shallow water or certain species in a genus which are sp uh, only found in the shallow water depths. And there are others which are right, found so only in the deep go. waters. Now, when I say shallow and deep, the you, the general demarcation is the 200 meter cutoff of depth. Because after 200 meters, we lose, the aphotic zone starts and we lose all kinds of visible light. So, but there are several octocorals that have very wide de depth ranges. Uh, some of them even extend from uh, 100 or 60 meters of depth to 2,000 meters of depth. And wow. again, yeah, yeah we places. have like, these can be at the level of genus, this can be at the level of uh, species or the level of a family. That level changes uh, specific to the groups that we are studying. I know I know that for uh, the genus level, even for several sea pens, we have many that extend from quite shallow water, shallow water depths to very deep of like maybe, uh, even though it is the deep sea, say from 400 meters to 6,000 meters, or from 200 or 100 meters to 3,000 meters. And there are some which are only found within the upper 50 meters, mm. or maybe in the deeper like 1,500 to 4,000. And another thing Polynesia that's important bit. is that the depth ranges right. differ based on the ocean that we are. There I, at l I have at least seen a certain pattern where generally depth distributions After are deeper in the Atlantic for several of the octocorals uh, than the uh, Pacific Ocean and that has got to do with the basic geology of these oceans and how they differ. So. Again, yes and no. <laughs> so it, it's not we'll clear. It's not clear why this happens. And this again Atlanta. goes back to the theory that the hypotheses, that which are several hypotheses that are there, that did the deep water corals evolve we'll from the shallow bonus. water corals? Did they evolve and radiate into the deep sea? Or was it that the deep sea corals then uh, evolved to shallow water ones and radiated into the shallow water habitats? Or there has been a mixture. So, as far as I can see, it's probably be, has been a mixture, and especially because uh, the upper layers of ocean are more vulnerable to climate change. Uh, I mean, yes, down. right yeah, now probably. we are going through an anthropogenic climate change, but historically, coming down to the cli the climatic changes that have happened because of the geological history of the Earth. So s all the fauna and flora have been lost in the upper layers of the ocean and the terrestrial, and they had to be recolonized. What's so that? at those times, a deeper ocean could have acted as a refuge here. And so it is very, we don't know yet. Those are right. things that we are still trying to find out, and I'm also trying to find out for the seabed, so. Yeah, That's so interesting. interesting. And um, recently, uh, during the Asia Pacific Coral Reef Symposium, yeah. we also, I'm sorry, I forgot, the person that presented this research, um, but they were talking about how corals actually also ha exist on a spectrum of like more um, like heterotrophic, where they're yes. catching things in the water yeah. and eating them, and more autotrophic, like relying on their symbionts, the algae yeah. inside of them, um, to get energy from sunlight. And you know, it, it used to seem like more of a dichotomy, like it's either or, but yeah, actually they exist both. like yeah in a spectrum. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Yep. That's it? Yes, please,
And I think um, just expanding more on your what you mentioned with the refugia, right? So by that we mean like refuges where um, corals will be able to survive just in, in light of climate change because the conditions aren't as harsh. So that's very interesting about the deep sea, but also other potential refuges like um, I believe seagrass can also help potentially uh, mitigate some of the impacts of ocean acidification and um, reduce incidences of coral disease even. Certain species have been found to do that, so um, they can also help act as a refuge. And um, I think there's other environmental circumstances as well. Yes, absolutely. And this is, I, I, this is not just true for the corals. This is true for, I think, most deep sea biota that we see. Beads, sponges, crustaceans, mollusks. There have been several studies on mollusks actually addressing these questions. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. And just like tree rings, uh, the coral skeleton have uh, is known to record uh, climatic conditions because uh, they are deposited from the ocean water, right? They are taking in the calcium and the aragonite. And I forgot which one, I can look that up, but uh, higher percentages of aragonite or higher percentage of calcite determines the can tell us what the oceanic conditions were when those parts of the skeleton uh, were deposited. So a skeleton just like, like a tree, it also increases in diameter with time as the coral colony grows. So they have isotopic signals and for each layer, if there is higher aragonite or calcite can tell us how, what were the corresponding oceanic conditions and that has been co uh, correlated with the various geological periods. Wow. The Earth's history. So they look at the, that ratio for each layer? Yeah, yeah, wow. they have done that and it's possible to do for like bigger fans which have thick. Isn't uh, each layer pretty thin? Yeah, very thin. Wow. Yeah. I'm amazed I, they yeah. can separate them I've out. I've read like about that. those works. I've never What's been involved that? in that, but. I'm calling another one. Uh, one. This is a beautiful outcrop again. It's full of chrysogorgias. So many chrysogorgias just tucked underneath and upside down. And there are many cup corals as well. If this rock was 2,000 meters shallower, it'd be menpachis all <laughs> over in the under the underhang. And it's interesting, like we even on different sides of the rocks, we can see such differences, right? The extensions and the outcrops. Again, when I use these terms, please do not think that I'm using them in the more scientific way. I'm not. I'm using the, them in the ways that I sort of understand these structures or use words to describe it, but on the underside and the extended parts of these boulders, we are seeing higher density of coral colonies than on the top or on maybe, yeah, than on the top. Right. Right. For, right. for our viewers, uh, Upashana's bio biological terminology, very, very precise. <laughs> Geological terminology, uh, maybe double check that for those. <laughs> well, Absolutely. You know, we have, we have two geologists <laughs> on this expedition and apparently they geologists also need to sleep and eat so <laughs> we do not have a geologist on our watch yes. but they are geologists on other watches actually we so have we have two and a half because mike studied geology as well yeah that's true uh, yes true and we still didn't get one <laughs> <laughs> what's up with that <laughs> i'll take i'll take hans over them yeah. no 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 yeah no. <laughs> I love having you here, Hans. Pretty sure geologists make stuff up as they go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, then I am a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Push in there while we're waiting for the ship. Yes. 
I think those are probably right. primnoid that makes colonies. Sense, though, if you just look at rocks. Uh, but what's the white blob? Squishy. Squishy. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a small encrusting sponge, and I think there's a small stylasterid over there. I may be wrong, but it kind of looks like a stylasterid or a bryozoan. This white thing. Oh yeah. Can be a bryozoan. And we haven't seen bryozoans, but they're really small and difficult. They look like, s bryozoans are so beautiful and uniform, they look like small banyan, banyan trees. But maybe people don't get the reference of banyan trees, oh, that's a very... Well, we know banyan trees. Yeah, that's a very Asian Indian thing. So yeah, yeah that looks more like a dead sponge, not a... Mm -hmm. My eyes are playing games. But uh, yeah, we have some Chrysogorgias, nice uh, primnoid fans. Do you think this diversity and density would be worth taking a Niskin sample? Oh yeah, Niskins, right? Uh, We've collected three so far. I know they were collected in areas of Paragorgia and um, Chrysogorgia primarily. Okay. So this is a little different, but let me double check. Yeah. I don't know. I'm still pretty traumatized from the last Niskin <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, yeah. It seems like the other ones have been going well so far, and they started with six, so we're don't, in. Don't jinx it. Yeah, we're yeah. in. Again, is it? I'll knock on wood. <laughs> did did wood? the ball come up in recovery? Some Negative. things. Okay, so... Um, their notes say uh, mostly hemichralium or paragorgia and anthomastis. Okay. They do say white paragorgia colonies, though, okay. so it could be similar. Yeah, so in this place has or primnoid, most yeah. so chrysogorgias, some primnoids, some hydroids, and there were a couple of uh, polysoma or colophagous sponges on the top. So what do you want to do? We're at waypoint seven, which is halfway up in terms yeah. of waypoints. Yeah. I think we can wait until we, we get wait, to the top because yeah. there will be more diversity there's, there's probably. Yes. Yeah, we're right at the slope change, and so I think if we ascend some more, we might see some more difference. Okay, you can go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I think that's so. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that that's seems reasonable. good plan. Well, you know, judging from the high pack, it's some slope change. I think I agree with Mia. High pack is is difficult to. There are there are better visuals for topography. Do you want to turn or me yeah. for the? I'm gonna pack. turn. You're good. I really love the three D model that you showed us in the morning. Yeah, that kind of made like because I've seen it, I Shake can understand this a little bit more. But oh, that's a big sponge. Yeah. It's really hard on this 2D view because, like I said, it's all green and it's hard to tell the gradient, you know, if you're decreasing or an increasing. So, I'm glad you guys appreciated the 3D view. <laughs> I don't know what sponge that is. That is not an elephant ear sponge. No. That looks like a dim sum sponge. I was going <laughs> to say, gonna like say a, a meringue, maybe. Yeah, Ooh. dim sum. Ah, oh, that's going to make me hungry now. Dumpling sponge. But it can be in the same family. No. Hans, you're going to have to recommend a really good dim sum place in Honolulu while I'm there. <laughs> no, I don't uh. want to be a part of these conversations because <laughs> I'm flying out the same day we are leaving. <laughs> and going back to the lab and everything, so no. <laughs> <laughs> well, next time you're back. Yes, <laughs> I do want to come back and you know, explore the place. Yeah, We just crossed a bamboo coral and there's again a very large and beautiful Elephant ear sponge, the polio yes. 
and a collar figures by its side and what looks like a dead vault area on that little rock. It almost looks like there's some like in a line if you look mm. at the herc view or the oh, yeah, 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 exactly i was looking at these two which are in view but yeah there was another like one third one yeah yeah it's a polyopagon garden i'm seeing another spongebob <laughs> and this one <laughs> it's a very square like shape yeah or english muffin like mm, yeah <laughs> you're hungry Everyone's aren't hungry. you <laughs> I, i'm Getting hungry now. <laughs> well, I could say tripe. <laughs> There's a nice ophiroid on the dead vault area sponge. And look at the structure of this for you. Yeah, they're just yeah. so oh, beautiful. Look yeah. and uniform they are. Honestly, that's like, it just seems like a very good uh, morphology to have in this environment to capture yeah. food. food and yeah, that's coming in. And I guess, yeah, that look at the, looking at the dead Walteria sponge, it seems like that might be the case. Falls in there. Yeah. That, that's a really good morphology to have in this environment. Like See how you get the patterns of the silicious speculars and the structure and the filtering system that they have with the ostia and the osculum. That's That is beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So go. much detail. Wow. Could like imagine drawing that. Her, her yeah. <laughs> it's a big it's sponge. Beautiful. Yeah. It is a big, big sponge. How tall would it be? Uh, well, meter I hit and my head on that camera when I stand under her. So. Yeah, two meters. Oh, about two That's meters. Tall. Wow. That is wild. Get another donkey in the back. There's a huge one back there. Yeah. Oh, I read a gorgia. A small little gorgia. Yeah. So from our other conversation about SpongeBob, there was <laughs> a message in the chat that I never got to read, mm -hmm. and they said that the species of sp that SpongeBob is is actually Aplacina fistularis, which is a tube sponge so is this a cheeto sponge <laughs> oh <laughs> i don't think so it's the spongebob sponge how do you aplicina is that what you said aplicina fistularis this looks like a young iridogorgia or an iridogorgia that is not in the greatest shape given hmm. i would say a young one. Oh, it a barrel sponge a sorry <laughs> go ahead sorry no 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 yeah okay it can go away but that is yellow. That is like very yeah. yellow. Because it, it doesn't have the complete spirals. Yeah. That's why it's young. Yeah. And also it still has like, as they grow, they lose the lower branches coming out. Yeah. So that's what kind of looks scruffy at the base. That's another big polypogon with a mushroom coral, or mm -hmm. No, the, what is that? That's a sea cucumber? The red thing on the rock? Or an, an, enemy. Enemy. an enemy. An enemy. An enemy. Yeah. Quick zoom on There's the so much thing. variation in the shapes of these polyopogon sponges. Yeah. I mean, I guess that makes sense because it's not a species name. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. And also, I think there's like many species in this genus. Mm -hmm. Also. It's like color figures. Like there's so much variation in the. Within the that is huge. Wow. There's a very tall bamboo web, probably a lepidosis web on the right. That is huge. Oh, there's another one. Oh, wow. Yeah. They keep going in a yeah. line. Is there a drop off on the other end? And there, or is that just an illusion? Yeah, that's the, it's a, yeah. Oh, yeah, I can see the contour line. Yeah. Kirk here in Hempack. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah, they're both facing the yeah. open water that, over there. Exactly. Oh, that was like the fourth or fifth one, you know, going. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, Hanzo and Gretel leading us astray with candy. <laughs> <laughs> that is a nice view of the bamboo coral web also. I 
I think hey, it was breadcrumbs. Can we do a 20 meter move to the west, please? Yes. Oh, nice. It's nice. Wow. Coming down to give you more real estate. Thank you. Yep. that a bunch of them? Yeah. Different sizes? Yeah. Have you seen this before? No. Not like so many in a yeah. sort really of an cool. arra linearized arrangement. It's kind of like, you know, like a, they're forming a trail along the edge of the... Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. They're so linear. Mm -hmm. And it's like if you look down, you like from uh, the Hercules view, you can see that there's more there's down, more down along there, yeah. the yeah. So they're just f on that ledge facing the water current that's coming in, which makes great sense. But it's just amazing how these animals, these organisms, they make use, best use of the environment that they are in, mm -hmm. and which is not just in the deep sea everywhere. Right. I guess in if nature, you're, yeah. If you're a larva sponge larvae yeah. and you don't land in the right place th or choose the right place yeah. then you just don't yeah. make it so exactly. maybe we're just seeing the winter sponges exactly. i guess and also like how uh best suited each organism is in this world to utilize the resources that are available right and not mm -hmm. waste that's something i think oh yeah do. efficiency yeah, yeah it's about efficiency i think we are the only ones who waste <laughs> so much of our food. <laughs> yeah, and waste resources, uh, exploit resources, waste resources, and also I feel that humans are the only ones, or not humans, it, I think comes from primates, but humans mostly, where we exercise cruelty in a manner that you don't see anywhere else in nature. There's that one stalked something over there, standing alone among in the elephant ear garden yeah looks like a euplect talent because i don't see the inverted structure of a rosellid from here but there are definitely many of these elephant ear sponges along the ledge it's amazing mm -hmm. do another 20 west please Um, and for our viewer asking about the lasers, they're used to use, they're used to um, measure and the spacing is 10 centimeters. Yeah, otherwise it's really difficult to judge scale underwater. Yeah. Quite difficult, so it's very handy to have them. know how like a group of fish is called a school or like a group of jellies are called a smack like what is a group of sponges called a squish <laughs> a squish is a good term actually yeah. a town a gar like <laughs> garden orchestra orchestra i love that ah. <laughs> an orchestra of sponges i want to hear that music <laughs>
There's some really interesting ones, like a, I think like a group of crows is called a murder or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something like that, yeah. yeah. Something very... What is a group of jellyfish is called? I didn't know that. I believe a smack. A smack? Yeah, <laughs> like you're getting smacked in the face with a jellyfish. Yeah, I get, uh, yeah, that seems reasonable. <laughs> I wonder why crows get such get a sinister objective. Um, and just a few more fun ones I looked yeah. up on dictionary.com. A group of flamingos is called a flamboyance, mm -hmm. a lounge of lizards, a bloat of hippos, <laughs> a conspiracy of lemurs. <laughs> I see the conspiracy <laughs> of lemurs. <laughs> A convocation of eagles. They have a smack of jellyfish as well. An obstinacy, obstinacy of buffalo. Mm -hmm. um, an unkindness of ravens. <laughs> so maybe not a murder. I'm not sure. No, no, the murder of crows, uh, crows that's is true. true. Okay. Yeah, yeah. A business of ferrets. Mm -hmm. A mob okay. of kangaroos. A zeal of zebras. A shrewdness of apes. And a leap of leopards. I don't know about some of these, but yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, yeah, I don't know why the crows and the ravens get such sinister <laughs> objective. Conspiracy of lemurs. No, Consp <laughs> conspiracy of lemurs is a good one. And a smack of jellyfish. <laughs> And we're getting more questions about the size and ages of these sponges. So I believe um, earlier, Pashana, you said like in the several hundred years range. And if you look at those laser dots, those are 10 centimeters apart. So you can kind of imagine um, the size of these sponges. Yeah, we're also seeing them at an angle. But I mean, this could be anywhere between 10, 15 of those laser distances, more, you know, a meter, more, a meter and a half, yeah, two in meters. The, yeah, in width they are maybe half, 2.7 meters, right? Like around probably two and a half, three feet. If it's three feet, then it's a meter. One meter, yeah. yeah. Can be a meter, actually, yeah, right. And like this one specifically that is quite big and in height one and a half to two meters some of them I can uh, probably come up and uh, spin around now Roger. clockwise uh, come up and pull the tether tight and it's about 188. And we had a viewer share that a group of sea cucumbers is called a pickle. Mm 